So today we'll be looking at the diffraction of x-rays. So how do we use x-rays to determine atomic positions? And so again, the interaction of x-rays with matter, we talked about a, a little bit about this uh, early on when we were talking about x-ray generation. You can either do it through absorption of x-rays or transmission of x-rays. So absorption of x-rays is when you take a x-ray of your um, bone in the hospital is through absorption of x-rays and that's where you get the x-ray um, image. Now by the way the medical devices x-rays is different than uh, x-rays used in diffractometers. I mean it's still x-rays but it's different types of x-rays. Then we also have x-ray transmission <clears throat> where you scatter x-rays when it hits uh, an object and there are two types of scattering as Compton scattering and Rawley scattering. And so Compton scattering is when you scatter the x-rays, the wavelength is changed. So when the x-rays get scattered, there's a change in the wavelength of the scattered x-ray. So if you remember from uh, Gen Chem 1, when you talked about wavelength and energy, when wavelength changes, the energy of that photon changes. So with Compton scattering, what you're seeing is a change in the energy, you get a change in the wavelength. Because as wavelength decreases, energy increases, and as wavelength increases, energy decreases. So that's what you see when you see a wavelength of scattering. Uh, X-ray is shifted. So there's a change in the wavelength of the X-ray. The other one is Rayleigh scattering, which is the incoming X-ray and the scatter X-ray have the same wavelength. And so you can think of Compton scattering as inelastic scattering because there's a change in energy, whereas Rayleigh scattering is going to be more like elastic scattering. Since there's no change in energy, there's no change in the wavelength. Because when wavelength changes, energy changes because they're related to one another. And so when an X-ray comes in, again, a monochromic uh, X-ray meaning it's one wavelength. So in uh, X-ray crystallography, we use the K-alpha X-ray. So as it comes in, it strikes the atom in the crystal. Wherever the uh, electrons are or the atom is, it's going to scatter because there's electrons in the crystal, in the atom. So when the X-rays hit the electrons, they're going to be scattered. And then we pick up that scattering um, on the detector. And so here we're using Rayleigh scattering because when the X-rays come in and scatter, when after they hit the electrons in the atom, they have the same wavelength. So there's no change in the wavelength before or after the scattering of X-rays. And that would complicate Bragg's law because remember Bragg's law is n lambda equals 2d sine theta. So there's no change in the wavelength after it's been diffracted. It's the same wavelength or else we would have lambda one and lambda two if it was Compton scattering. So Raleigh scattering is what we use because as it comes in, the wavelength remains constant. There's no change in the wavelength. Now, this is what happens when X-rays strike atoms in a crystal. We're not talking about how we produce X-rays. That's something different. This is the, after you produce the X-ray, this is how it acts when it hits an atom, the electrons in an atom. And so what happens when the x-rays strike the atoms, if you remember these atoms are on planes and these planes are separated by what we talked about is the spacing. And so as the x-rays come through, they strike the different HKL planes and from that we produce these waves coming out through the other end as it strikes. And this is similar to if you take a rock and throw it in the pond, you get these ripples. The same thing as these x-rays come through, these little spacings through the d-spacing, the HKL planes, they have a space between them. As the x-rays come through, they form these waves and some waves interact constructively and some waves interact uh, destructively. And so the ones we're interested in are the waves that act, uh, that interact constructively. Because as we'll see in a second, 
uh, waves that are destructive, they cancel each other out. So we won't see them on the diffraction image. So what we're interested in are the constructively interfering waves. And again, you imagine we have a crystal that has these HKL planes, and on these planes are atoms. So the X-rays, as they come through the planes, they form these waves, and we're looking for constructively interfering uh, X-rays. And so with Bragg's Law, we've talked about this early on, but the incoming X-ray beam strikes the plane. It gets scattered, and then the scattered wave is what is picked up by the detector. And so from this, we derive Bragg's Law in lambda 2D sine theta. And again, the D spacing is the distance between the different HKL planes. And we talked a little bit about how we can take the despacing of certain uh, HKL planes and determine the length of the axes. So we know if we have the 100 zero zero reflection plane and we know the despacing in that, we can calculate the length of the A axis, et cetera. So with certain HKL planes, you can determine lattice parameters. The, the key thing to remember is that D spacing and theta, which is the angle, are inversely related to one another. So if your D spacing is small, you're going to have a very large theta. So higher theta values means you have smaller D spacing, better resolution. Lower theta values means you have larger D spacing. Oh, excuse me. Higher theta value, lower D spacing, higher resolution. So the lower the D spacing, the higher resolution you get in your diffraction data. Whereas if it's low theta, which is high D spacing, you're going to get lower resolution data. And so there's an inverse relationship between the theta and the D spacing. And so the diffracted x-rays, again, what we're looking for are the ones that are constructively interfering. So if we have our original wave is in lambda out of phase. We have the scattered wave like this. So they're, in, they're out of phase in lambda. Or if we take the original waves, which is n over 2 lambda out of phase, you see the left-hand side, when we add these two waves, they are constructively interfering. And that's what we're looking for. So we have the original wave coming in. We have the diffracted waves. We get uh, or we have original waves that are in lambda, the scattered out of phase, they constructively interfere, we get double the amplitude. And so this is a wave that would strike the detector. Whereas if they're in and over two lambda out of phase, this is called destructive interference. So what happens is when you add these two waves together, they cancel each other out because the valley or the trough of one wave lines up with the peak of another. So the resultant wave is completely destroyed. And so what we're looking for is the waves that constructively interfere. And these are the one, going to be the ones that are in lambda out of phase, not in over two lambda out of phase. And remember Bragg's law is in lambda equals 2d sine theta. So the n lambda waves are going to be in phase. The n over 2 lambda waves are going to be out of phase. So they're going to be destructive interference.
So another way to think about Bragg's Law, and this is interesting, I'm actually going to show you a real love example of this, is something called Ewald's sphere. And so Ewald's sphere is a sphere, an imaginary sphere around a crystal where the radius of the sphere is approximately one over lambda. And so what happens is wherever the lattice points touch that sphere is where the x-rays will diffract. And so what we see is when we see a diffraction pattern, we're seeing where lattice points in the crystal line up with the uh, edge of that sphere. And this is what's referred to as Ewald's sphere. So again, you, you have this imaginary sphere around the crystal. Wherever the lattice points on the crystal line up with the edge of the sphere, which is shown with these points here, you get a diffracted or a scattered x-ray. And so you get this diffraction image shown on the detector. And so I'm going to show you what this looks like. You actually, when you combine all the different diffracted images, you can actually reconstruct the Ewall sphere of that crystal. You can see where all the different lattice points are on that sphere. So again, this is an imaginary sphere where as the x-rays come in, the lattice points of the crystal that line up with the surface or the uh, edge of the sphere are going to diffract uh, x-rays. And so the way this works is if you know the crystal to detector distance, you can then calculate 2 theta and the D spacing. And from that, you can calculate the HKL values. So the crystal and detector are a certain distance apart. And for most times, it's about 35 millimeters when you're doing small molecules. That's the uh, most commonly used uh, detector to crystal distance. And on top of that, you know the orientation of the crystal because it's set by machine parameters. So by knowing all those components and where it diffracts, you can then calculate the two theta and D spacing values. And then as we saw when we did our HKL homework, we can then assign HKL values for each diffraction spot. And so that's how they construct the HKL uh, values. And so the diffraction image that we see is actually in reciprocal space. It's not real space. It's the opposite of real space. We call it uh, reciprocal space. And so as, the, as we said earlier, as the D spacing increases, theta must decrease so that we have constructive interference. And so what we're looking at are the diffraction spots in the reciprocal space which are very close together, have small theta differences. So if they have small theta differences, they're going to have a very large D spacing, which is the real distance between the planes. So when you look at the spots, the ones that are very close together are going to have a large D spacing, very small theta. And so the diffraction images that we see are actually in what we call reciprocal uh, space, not real space. So the one on top, this is reciprocal space, which is the opposite of real space. I don't reciprocal. So in reciprocal space, that's what the diffracted image looks like, and on the one on the bottom is real space. Again, these are mathematical terms that we use. So when you diffract an x-ray, what we're seeing on the diffraction image is reciprocal space, which is the dots. If it was real space, it would look like what's on the bottom of it. And so what we get from the diffraction pattern is actually the reciprocal lattice. And then as we'll see in a few slides, you can actually take the reciprocal lattice and calculate the direct lattice. So 
uh, and we'll talk about the diffuse scattering in a uh, in a lecture to come. All right. So again, we look at reciprocal space, not real space. And I can show you when we look at the uh, actual data, I can show you the difference between the two. Nope. So now we're talking about real and reciprocal space. And again, the distance between the spots, we can determine the D spacing and theta values. And so again, for uh, waves that remain in phase, they have to abide by Bragg's law, which is n lambda 2D sine theta. And so for example, if this was n over 2 lambda 2D sine theta, it would be out of phase. So again, we're looking at those in phase scattered waves. And so the uh, intensity of the reciprocal lattice of the scatter radiation forms these spots and from these spots we can determine uh, the lattice parameters and the HKL values. And so on the bottom you see what's the real space and the real space is what we call a diffuse pattern. So it's kind of like smudges uh, on the image. And so these two spots represent these two, you could say, circles of diffracted images. And so the further apart these two spots are, you see the more, the finer the real space looks like. So when they're close together, the real space is kind of smeared together. And then when we have the diffracted spots in the line, we see the same thing in real space. And what you're looking at is in reciprocal space is orthogonal to real space. So since real re reciprocal space is like this, they're horizontal, real space, they're vertical. So there's an opposite uh, direction for real and reciprocal space. So again, the top one is reciprocal space, which is what we use to uh, determine lattice parameters, HKL values. The bottom is real space. So again, the computer or the software, what it does is it determines the real space lattice parameters and then converts it to reciprocal space lattice parameters. So you can see the more uh, complex your diffracted image is, the more complex the real space looks as well. So there is symmetry in uh, diffraction images. So if you have something like a molecule, then you may get diffracted images that kind of show up as a molecule. So here we have a six diffracted spots on an image. Maybe it's a benzene ring. And you see the same type of image illustrated in real space. Again, maybe this image in the middle refers to a toluene. And you see how that changes between benzene and toluene, the difference in the real and reciprocal spaces. Now for the benzene ring, for example, there could be a maybe a two-fold rotational axis here, and you would also see the same symmetry in real space. So there'd be a two-fold, or actually if it's opposite, it would look like this, because they're orthogonal. So you rotate, you know, uh, to 180 degrees, you can generate the other set of diffracted images. So there is symmetry in the diffraction uh, data, and that helps when collecting data. So now we have toluene, for example. We see it's real space, a little bit more complex. So the more complex the molecules are, the more complex the diffracted images are in real and reciprocal space. So again, the top one is reciprocal space. The bottom one is real space.
So now if we look at crystals, so here we have two different crystals of of benzene. And so on the top is what we're used to seeing uh, in the fraction pattern. So these are an infinite array of molecules. And these are actually polymorphs of benzene. So the two different types of polymorphs that we have in benzene. Again, remember polymorph is two different crystal, two or more different crystalline forms of uh, the same molecule. So we have two polymorphs of benzene, and you see that we get two completely different diffraction images. So even the diffraction images can be distinguished between the two different polymorphs because it's a different type of crystal. They're going to diffract differently. So again, from the spacing of the diffraction, diffracted spots, they can calculate things like despacing, uh, two theta, etc. Now there are some things that can happen when you have when you don't have a single crystal. So there's some discontin discontin discontinuities in the crystal, and these are two things where we can have twinning. And twinning is when you have, you know, two or more crystals that are kind of fused together. So when you put the crystal on the machine, you see that it's not just a single crystal. You have maybe two crystals with slightly different unit cells. And uh, this causes discontinuity in the uh, crystal. And so therefore, you actually get two diffracted images, two diffraction patterns on the same image. And so the, the key thing for uh, uh, twinning is you'll see what are called satellite spots on a diffraction image. And later on, we'll look at some twinning data just to give you an idea of what twinning looks like. But see here, this peak and this peak, they're like satellites of each other. So it indicates that you may have a twin crystal. Also, if you notice, there's a smearing of the diffraction spots, which could indicate uh, twinning as well. So these are things to look out for in the diffraction uh, images to see if you see sisters, what we call satellite or sister spots, or smearing of the crystals. So what happens is you have two crystals that are slightly uh, oriented differently when the diffraction, when the x-rays come in and scatter, you're actually getting scattered x-rays from unit cell one and unit cell two. So they're kind of interfering with each other. And that's why you get these sister spots or smearing of the crystal. Now on the right side, we have a crystal with multiple different orientations. And so again, this could be that when you mounted the crystal, it had, it was actually two or three different types of crystals fused together. And that causes this smearing that we see on the diffraction image. Because now not just, you're not just scattering from one unit cell, you're scattering from three or four different unit cells. So again, discontinuities in the crystal can cause, will show up in the diffraction pattern. And that's something you have to look out for when you're collecting data. So you want to try to get the best single crystal you can when you put it on when you're collecting data. And so you do see symmetry in um, diffracted, uh, diffraction in reciprocal and re real space. So if your, if your crystal has mirror or rotational symmetry, you're going to see that show up in the reciprocal space and real space diffraction data. So the, the symmetry gets transferred from the crystal to the uh, image. So you can see rotational and mirror symmetry in the image. And so this shows you the relationship between real and reciprocal space. So you have this <clears throat> direct lattice, so these D spacings. The x-rays come in, they get scattered, 
they form the reciprocal space lattice. And so you get this diffraction image, and from this, we can determine the reciprocal lattice uh, constants, just like you have A, B, and C, alpha, beta, gamma, for real space. You also have A star, B star, C star, which represents uh, reciprocal space. And so again, the crystal is the real space or direct space. The scattered x-rays form the reciprocal space. So as the x-rays come in, they get scattered when they show up on a diffraction image, we form reciprocal space. Now reciprocal space is good to help us determine uh, spots, the, 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 the diffracted spots, but we need to know the actual uh, lattice parameters of the real space. So again, from the reciprocal space, we get this nice diffraction image. And so from the spots, we can determine that this is going to be C star down this axis and A star along this axis. So we can measure the distance between the spots. We can determine the length of C star and A star, and therefore we can determine the uh, the length of A and B or A and C uh, lattice parameters. And so it's the opposite between real and reciprocal. So if C star is less than A star, that tells you that C is going to be greater than A. And so the dash unit cell is the unit cell of the reciprocal lattice. The solid line unit cell is the unit cell of the uh, direct lattice. You can see they're inverse of one another. And so this is what the, you know, what they used to do in the old days, they would measure the distance between the first set to determine what's the C star, A star, B star axes. And then from there, they can measure the D spacing, two theta values, determine the lattice parameters, then also determine HKO values. Nowadays, this is all done uh, with com computers. And so these are the actual equations of calculating uh, reciprocal lattice from real uh, lattice parameters or vice versa. So again, just like you have A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma, you're going to have A star, B star, C star, and then alpha star, gamma star, uh, beta star. Now one thing to note, for example, if you're in the monoclinic unit cell, you know that alpha and gamma equal 90. The same thing holds true for alpha star and gamma star. They also equal 90. But the reciprocal beta angle is actually 180 minus beta. So any angle that's not 90 to get its reciprocal angle, you have to subtract it from 180. And just like you have the volume of the real space, you also have the volume of the reciprocal space. And so what we do is to get between direct space and reciprocal space is we do what's called a Fourier transformation. And Fourier transformations is a whole topic on itself. But just to let you know, the way we go from real to reciprocal or reciprocal to real is we do a Fourier transformation on the data and that converts it from reciprocal to real space. And this technique is what computers use to convert from reciprocal space to real space, vice versa. So real space deals with the crystal, reciprocal space deals with the diffraction path. So when the crystal scatters the x-rays, you get the diffraction pattern, which is in reciprocal space. Once you determine the reciprocal space, you use Fourier transfer to convert it to real space. And the reason we do Fourier transfer, this helps us identify where the uh, HKL planes are in real space. And that's what we need in order to solve 
the crystal structure, we need to know what HKO planes are present and the intensity of those reflections. So again, Fourier transfer is the link between real and reciprocal space. And so let's say you have a randomly oriented crystal like you would on any um, time you mount a crystal, unless it's a cubic crystal where it's easy to determine the, uh, you know, the uh, cell lengths and angles. You just have a randomly oriented crystal, which is what you have most of the time. What we do is we do Fourier transforms on a series of data to determine the lattice parameters. And this is referred to as auto indexing. So anytime you collect crystal data, and I'll show you this auto indexing at the end of the lecture, you use data from several images and the minimum, I think when I do, when, we, when auto indexing is done on the uh, Synergy S, which is the more advanced uh, system that we have, you know, you need like, it uses 20 images and from the 20 images, it does auto indexing to determine the lattice parameters and so what auto, auto indexing does is it looks at all the different diffraction spots determines the reciprocal parameters and then converts it to real space lattice parameters through Fourier transform again this is done with computers it takes a long time if you were going to do it by hand now for something like a sodium chloride crystal it might be easier to determine the lattice parameters because for sodium chloride it's only cubic uh, crystal system so you're only going to have one unique axis and all the angles are 90. So for, for example sodium chloride is something maybe you could measure the distance of the spots to determine the uh, lattice parameters but for most crystals you're going to be using auto indexing. So it takes a series of images, it looks at all the different diffraction spots on each image, determines reciprocal lattice information, Fourier transform, converts it to real lattice information. This is all done, I mean, with computers, it takes seconds, not much longer. And I'll show you an example of this at the end. And so this is actually the mathematics of how auto indexing uh, works. So it takes the components of the reciprocal lattice vectors, multiplies that matrix by an HKL, and you get the reciprocal lattice vectors of the fraction spots. And so from this, you get what's called observed reflections. And so this is how reciprocal lattice vectors and geometrical angles relate to one another. You don't have to worry about much about this, but this is the kind of the equation that auto indexing used to determine lattice parameters. So. And so the reason we're able to find the location of the fraction spots uh, once we get these scattered x-rays are detected is because we know the exact orientation of the crystal. So you, you, I mentioned earlier that we know the distance between the crystal and the detector. So we know how far the scattered x-ray travels after it's diffracted from the crystal to the detector. Typically that distance is about 35 millimeters for small molecules. We also know the orientation of the crystal when we mount it because the crystal sits on what's called a goniometer. And so a goniometer is a, a device that is used to rotate the crystal typically in four different axes so that it knows the correct orientation of the crystal when x-rays strike it. So you know the angles of the crystal, you know the distance from the crystal to the detector, and now you can back calculate and determine information about your diffraction image. 
And so what you do is, and you, if you've seen the video of myself mounting a crystal, I mounted on what's called the goniometer head, which looks like one of these two devices. These are referred to as goniometer heads, where you mount your crystal onto. And so again, goniometers allow for you to move the crystal into different orientations. And so when you align the crystal, you make sure that as you rotate it, it's always in the center of the beam. So that's why it's important to align your crystal correctly so that every time the x-rays strike it, it's going to strike in the center, or it's always going to be in the center of the beam. You don't want it where one time it's in the center, the other time it's only at the edge. It's going to cause issues with your data. And the goniometer is fixed to the diffractometer. So the detector, which is the which you can move back and forth, the goniometer, which you can rotate, it's all connected in sync. So they know the angles of the goniometer. They know the distance between the crystal and the detector. Then they can use that to calculate properties of the reciprocal lattice space. And that's why it's very important that the crystal is centered in the X-ray beam. And so one of the axes that the goniometer has is the phi axis, which is what the goniometer head rotates on. So this is referred to as the uh, phi axis. And so when you're mounting a crystal, at least on the Synergy S system, you rotate it 90 degrees back and between zero and 90 degrees to make sure that when you rotate it, the crystal is always in the center of the beam. So you, you'll center it at zero degrees at the phi axis, you'll rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise, I believe so, and then you would center it again so that the uh, center of the beam is in the center of the crystal. You rotate it back to zero, you check it. If it's out of centering, you recenter it, rotate it back to 90, check it. If it's centered, rotate it back to zero, and then you're ready to roll. So uh, first, it's very important to get a single crystal, a good quality single crystal. Second, it's very important to make sure the crystal is centered in the x-ray beam. And this is stuff that needs to be done before you even collect uh, data. So, and so at the... Uh, goniometer, just to give you a little bit more information about the goniometer, you can have three circle or three axis, four axis diffractometers, meaning that the goniometer can rotate in three different angles or four different angles. <clears throat> and so most area detectors, which is what the older version, the older diffractometer is, and the uh, newer diffractometer is you have a series of two theta values you can get more data collected for a crystal at different orientations because you can have the uh, diffractometer move the crystal into certain uh, angles and so at UTSA both of our diffractometers are four axis goniometers meaning we have four different angles, we can rotate the crystal. So let me explain each one of these. So the phi angle rotates the crystal, the actual crystal. So that's phi. Now chi rotates what the crystal sits on either positive or negative directions. So this is chi right here. It rotates the crystal sample holder, the goniometer head, this way and this way. So again, the phi axis is on the goniometer head, which rotates the actual crystal, so that can rotate, and then the goniometer head itself can be rotated on a chi axis, which is shown right here. And then all of this contraption can be rotated on omega axis, which is shown at the bottom. So the actual crystal 
the whole contraption that the crystal sits on can rotate positive and negative degrees. And then the last one is the two theta angle, which is the angle between the detector and the crystal, which is this axis right here. And that's where you get the four axes of rotation. And so when you're collecting data, the computer knows the phi angle, the chi angle, omega, and two theta. And so from that and the detector distance, they can determine parameters of the reciprocal lattice space. So again, phi rotates the actual crystal, chi rotates the goniometer head, omega rotates the whole goniometer, and two theta rotates the detector. And so when you're collecting data, after you do your initial check, the software determines what's the best orientations to collect the full uh, data set. And so here is just to kind of show you in real life, in real time, what the different angles are. And this is actually a, a first or a very old generation of detecting. So if you see here, it says mercury. Mercury was a detector I was trained on back in the early 2000s. And then when I first came to UTSA, they used what's called a Saturn area detector. And now they use a high pick. So this is kind of like, I wouldn't say first generation, but one of the earlier generations of area detectors. And then it was Saturn for a while, which is also an area detector. And then now we use high picks area detectors. And so let me explain the angles here. So here, this goniometer head rotates the phi axis, which is what the crystal sits on. So you can rotate the crystal just by rotating the goniometer head. Then the goniometer head rotates on this axis here, which is the chi axis. And then the whole goniometer system rotates about here, which is omega axis, or here, whichever one. This is omega. So the whole goniometer rotates. Actually, that's not omega. It's the first one. Yeah, not that one. So this whole arm here rotates 300, you know, not 360 degrees, but positive, negative degrees. That's the omega. And then lastly, the detector rotates about this back and forth. And this is two theta. This is two theta, omega, chi, and phi. So again, phi rotates the goniometer head, which is actually rotating the crystal. And then the whole thing that the goniometer head sits at rotates as well, which is chi positive, negative degrees. And then the whole goniometer itself rotates on omega. And then the detector moves what's called two theta. Oops. And so now by knowing the um, angles at which the diffraction images were collected at, we can calculate the HKL values and the unit cell. So here, for example, we know the chi, the omega, or excuse me, the phi, omega, and two theta values of a series of diffraction spots. From that, we use what we will call what's called integrating the data, we get HKL values. So from this, we get this. And this is important. The HKL values are important because that's how we determine which reflection planes are present and are not, and we can determine symmetry information. And so the way to determine 2 theta is by determining the distance. of the spot on the center, from center of the image to the distance of the detector from the crystal. And that's how they get the two theta. And so 
what they do is when you collect a series of diffraction images, you'll do auto indexing and it'll come back with something that looks like on the bottom that you can determine what type of unit cell do you want. So it, for example, there was auto indexing done on a series of data. It came back that it could be either monoclinic or triclinic based on the unit cell parameters. And so from here, the user has to decide is it monoclinic or triclinic? And so in this case, since alpha and gamma are very are exactly 90, and beta is not equal to 90, you can see that this suggests monoclinic. Furthermore, if you look at the triclinic one, in triclinic, don't worry about the angle, which one is alpha, beta, gamma, just look at the angle um, degrees. So alpha is 103, 0.68 for triclinic and beta is 90.15 and gamma is 90.10. And so just by auto indexing, if you just did it in triclinic, you would want to raise a, a flag here and say, well, beta and gamma are very close to 90 and alpha is not equal to 90. So I don't think it would be triclinic, it should be monoclinic. So you would choose the monoclinic uh, setting. So another important thing is resolution. And so resolution determines how fine of a D spacing we can uh, detect. So for in lambda, 2D thine theta, again, like we said, smaller D spacing corresponds to larger two theta angles. And this is important, and I'll try to show you this as well. Large two theta angles located near the edge of the diffraction image. And I'll show you an example of that. And so the third bullet is very important. The quality of your high angle data determines how good your resolution of your structure will be. So if you don't have spots near the edges of your diffraction image, that tells you you don't have very good resolution data. And if you don't have good high resolution data, remember that's in reciprocal space, when you convert it to real space, you're not going to have very good resolution of your structure. So you always want to make sure that you have spots located near the edges of your diffraction image, which correlates to high two theta values, better resolution. And so the type of radiation you use determines the uh, two theta value, the highest two theta value you can have. So for example, if you use molybdenum radiation, the highest two theta value you can get is approximately 65 degrees, maybe 75 degrees two theta. Whereas if you use copper radiation for most, you know, well diffracting crystals, you know, this is the case we're looking at, for copper, you can get up to a two theta of 155, 160 degrees two theta. So copper can give you higher resolution because it can measure smaller D spacing um, values. So that means higher two theta. So that's why it's good to collect if you can collect data with for small molecules with copper radiation. And you see here that maximum resolution is limited by lambda over 2 sine theta max. And so let me just show you what each of these are for molybdenum and for copper. And since copper has a higher wavelength, it's going to have a higher maximum resolution. So just give me one second. We'll calculate that real quick. And we'll use the theta max of 65 for molybdenum for 60. Ah, let's do 65. That's 65 2 theta max. So, you know, that's for most small molecules. You're looking at around 65 degrees 2 theta max for molybdenum. So we calculate the resolution.
oops, theta. You gotta be careful. So sine is theta max. What I have is two theta. So let me redo that. And so we get a resolution of 0.66 angstroms. Now, if we look at uh, copper, which has a theta, a two theta max, I would say around 160 degrees. Divide by two, remember? Sine of 80. You get about 0.78 angstrom. So you get a higher resolution uh, with the copper. And so typically, actually, no, yeah. Typically, for most small molecules, you want about 0.83 angstroms. And actually, I'm mistaken. Molybdenum actually has better resolution than copper. So, but the thing is, is yes, molybdenum has better resolution than copper, but molybdenum is not as powerful as copper. And so, for most things. Most small molecules that aren't well diffracting, you won't get that resolution anyways. So it's better to use copper, which has, you know, roughly a resolution of 0.78, so that you get better or more high angle data than you would if you use molybdenum to try to achieve a 0.66 resolution. So if you, you, if you mounted the same crystal using molybdenum radiation and copper radiation, a, molybdenum is not as powerful, so you're going to take longer scan times, and you may not have as much high angle data as you would if you use copper. Uh, with copper, you're looking at shorter, it's more powerful, it's shorter scan times, and since it's more powerful, you're going to get higher, or you know, more higher 2 theta data. And so you're more likely with copper in a very quick amount, a very quick turnaround, obtain the threshold of 0.83 angstroms than if you would with molybdenum. Molybdenum may do it, but you may have to have longer scan time because its, it's x-rays are not as powerful as copper. And so for small molecules, that's what we're looking for, 0.83 angstroms. So for molybdenum, the 2 theta is roughly 50 degrees 2 theta, correlates to 0.83 angstroms. For copper, Roughly 130 degrees 2 theta correlates to 0.83 angstroms. But remember, the more high 2 theta data you have, the more high resolution data you have, the easier it's going to be to solve your structure. If you don't have high resolution data, you're going to have issues solving the structure. And we'll show you an example of that in just a second, but this, just to give you a little bit of a summary. So when, when you're doing structure solution, the first thing you do is you solve the structure. And solving the structure utilizes the low angle data, the low two theta data. Once you solve the structure, then you have to refine the structure model. And when you refine the structure model, you use the high two theta data, which is your high resolution data. So the high resolution data is used to refine the structure. The low resolution data is used to just solve the structure and get a starting point for you to refine it. So if you don't have high angle data, you may be able to solve the structure, but you won't be able to refine it to an acceptable uh, model. So you got to have high angle data uh, when you collect uh, on a crystal. So for small molecules, it's about 0.83 angstroms. Uh, for macromolecules, I mean, because we're talking about proteins, we're looking at about two angstrom <clears throat> uh, resolution. So resolution is important. It is important. So let's just show you how resolution plays a part. So here we're looking at 
uh, two electron density peaks or electron density maps. And we have one at 4.5 angstroms, 3.1 angstroms. And inset is where the atoms are for each one of these molecules. So at 4.5 angstroms, what we see is we have a region of electron density here. We have a high region of electron density here. And there's a region of electron density, there's a hole here. Now when we go to lower resolution, we go to 3.1 angstroms. Now you see that the electron density peaks are becoming a little bit more resolved. So now instead of just a big blob in the center here, we have a more well-defined electron density peak. But we still don't know where atoms are because in order to solve atomic positions, electron density peaks have to correlate to atomic positions. And right now, there's no peak that shows atomic positions. So again, there's a peak here, but that's about it. And there's you know something over here as well, but nothing correlates to atomic positions. Now, if we start zooming in to higher resolution, Now at uh, 2.4 angstroms, you see we start getting a peak here, a more resolved electron density peak. So there's a peak here, here, here. But we still don't know atomic positions. Now when we go to 1.9 angstroms, you see now the electron density map, the contours are becoming more well defined. So we know that there's a region of electron density here, 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 and here. And now we start to see just some peaks corresponding to atomic positions, but not many. So we see, you know, peaks here, there's a peak here, which correlates to a carbon atom. There's a peak here that correlates to a carbon or no, actually nitrogen atom, peak here. So we're starting to see some resolution at about 1.9 angstroms. Now, if we go to one angstrom, we see now that at one angstrom, there's a peak here, here. So I'm not going to circle all of them, but you see now we're starting to see that there's peaks starting to form where the atoms are situated. And so now we're able to assign atomic positions for those electron density peaks. And if we go to 0.83 angstroms, you see that now the peaks are well defined. And so everywhere that there's an electron density peak, that actually correlates to an atom. So what you would do is you would go in and you would label this peak here, for example, a carbon atom. You would label this peak here a carbon atom, you know, and go through and label everything maybe carbon atoms and then refine the structure. You may have to change atom types. Now, this peak here, since it only has two hydrogens off of it, it could either be a nitrogen or it could be a uh, double bond carbon, but it depends on if this ring is a benzene ring or cyclohexane ring. And that, Probably more than likely, since it's like this, it's probably a benzene ring. So these are probably NH2 uh, groups. So once you get to a resolution of about 0.83, you're able to resolve the electron density peaks enough that you can assign atomic positions uh, to them. So here is an organometallic structure. So we're actually going from low resolution, or excuse me, high resolution to low resolution. And you see how the electron density peaks become less resolved as we go to high resolution. So this is a um, organometallic structure involving copper. So this very dark region here is the copper atom. And this is a uh, nitrogen. So if you notice, if you connect all of these, 
you get a pyridine ring. And then we have an ethyl group off of it. So at 0.66 angstroms, we get a very good resolution data. You can even point out some hydrogens as well. Now, if we decrease the resolution to 1.5 angstroms, now these atomic positions are not very well defined. If we go to two angstroms, it becomes even less defined. Now we don't even see anything that resembles a ring from the electron density peaks. So the less resolved the electron density peaks, the harder it is it's going to be to assign atoms to those electron density peaks. That's why it's very important that you have high resolution data so that you can refine the structure and see where the where there are electron density peaks and what atoms correlate to those peaks. And so that concludes the talk on the fraction of x-rays. And so I'm going to stop this part of the lecture and then we're going to look at some real-time uh, examples of what we just discussed here on the lecture. And then after that, I'll take a few questions. So now what I want to show you here is, is actually explaining what we just talked about. So this is the Chrysalis Pro inner software that we use. And uh, I'm going to show you first how we do an auto indexing. So remember we talked about auto indexing. This is what you would do. So here you go to peak hunting. Sorry about that. And so we go to peak hunting and what's it, what it what it does is it looks through all the the fraction images and finds all the spots and then, so if you see in the background everywhere there's a spot it's, it's recording all the different spots from all the different images and so in this run we did it was 17 different uh types of runs so it went through it collected all the different uh, spots from every image now what you do is here's where the auto indexing kicks in. We're going to find a unit cell. Now on this uh, page here, or this window, if you had some suspicion that you thought it was twin, then you would select twin. But for most of the time, you're just doing single crystal. So you hit OK, and now it's auto indexing and boom. And within less than 30 seconds, we already have a unit cell for this uh, crystal structure. And so from the unit cell, you know, if we look at the angles, if we look at the current unit cell, you see that all three of the angles are very close to 90 degrees. So since all three alpha, beta, gamma are very close to 90 degrees, it constrains the unit cell to orthorhombic space group because remember orthorhombic alpha beta gamma equal 90 and you notice that a b and c uh, don't equal each other so obviously then it has to be orthorhombic crystal system and then you remember we talked about uh, cell reduction what was it called uh, reduced cell here it's looking to see if any of these if this current cell can be reduced down to a simpler cell and you'll notice that it can't. So what we're seeing is the reduced cell of this crystal structure. Again, it's orthorhombic. OP means orthorhombic primitive space group. So all of this it got in 20 seconds of calculations. And so from all the images, it found 3,000, or excuse me, from all the images, it found 3,310 spots. Out of that 3,310 spots to find, to calculate this unit cell, it was able to fit 3,208 spots out of the 3,310 spots to calculate this unit cell. So that's about 97% acceptance. So as long as this percent acceptance is 
you know, generally for full data collections, you want it to be close to above, you know, 85, 90%. If it's above 85, 90%, you're okay. If it's below 85%, you may want to think about looking at your diffraction data. Does it look twinned? If it is twinned, you could process it, but you're more likely to find to recollect it using a different crystal. So, so now we've determined the unit cell. Let me show you the something cool. So we go to what's called Ewald Explorer. We click on it. Let me organize this just a little bit. Let's see. move some things around so what you're looking at is the reciprocal lattice and so this is looking at the reciprocal lattice down the a star axis so here we have the reciprocal lattice a star b star uh, c star now the way you interpret this is if you look at this green blue uh, kind of grid everywhere the green blue intersects is a lattice point and so what you want to do is you want to make sure everywhere there's an intersection, there's a diffraction spot on that intersection. And that tells you that the diffraction data lines up with the uh, lattice parameter. So if we zoom in, not that much. Oh, made a mistake. Let's go back. So if we zoom in, we see that on most of these, we have a diffracted spot lining up with an intersection or a lattice point. And remember, this is primitive lattice, so there should only be a lattice point on every uh, corner. And this is looking down the A star axis. We look down the B star axis, you see again, we have majority of the spots, or all the spots actually line up on lattice points. Now, if it was twin, for example, you may see spots here. So if you see spots that don't line up on your intersections or lattice points, means maybe there's a different crystal with another unit cell, and that's why it doesn't line up. And so there you would investigate using the twin crystal function on Crystallis Pro. So now let me just show you the C-axis, and I'm going to show you something cool. So this is the C-axis, and so you see that wherever there's a diffraction spot it lines up with a lattice point and that's what you want that's good data right there now we talked about e wall sphere so let me show you what that looks like and so what you're looking at here is an e wall sphere so everywhere there was a lattice point on the uh edge of the e wall sphere it diffracted and we got a diffracted image and so this is just showing you all the different lattice points that were on the Ewald sphere. So this is what it's an imaginary sphere, but this is what it looks like when you reconstruct it based on the lattice points that diffracted X-rays. This is pretty cool. It looks like a kind of like a basketball, and it's kind of amazing that it's perfectly spherical. Looks like a watermelon, maybe. And another thing you want to look at, if you look at what's called the histogram, you want to make sure that your peaks here on the right-hand side are very well-defined uh, peaks. That means that there's not any kind of residual unresolved diffraction data there causing it to be uh, not well-defined. And so after you you know, determine your unit cell, then you would refine the instrument model. So you see that when we refined the instrument model, it went up a little bit more. Our acceptance was now 97%. Now down here, the instrument model contains all the different information about the goniometer. So that's all the machine constants that are used to help calculate the lattice constants. And so, on that note, that's all we have for this lecture. I just wanted to sh show, share with you some of the, uh, what's called cell indexing uh, process. So now if you have questions,